Well, I'm excited to even have the opportunity to come and speak with you today. Um, I'm always reminded every time I get the opportunity to speak of where God has brought me from. Um, I've been on staff here a little over seven years, just recently, obviously, in the last three to four years as the executive pastor. And I just begin to think about all that God has done to bring me to the point I'm at today. And uh, I think it's important for each one of us to probably take times to do that, to, to take a step back and see all that God's done in our lives to bring us to the point in which we're at. Because we can give him praise because there's no way that we could be where we're at today without God doing a work in us. Can I get an amen to that? I, I think that's true in each one of our lives. Those who've experienced that changing life from Christ and uh, Today, before I get to share a message, we're going to be in Esther chapter 4, so you can go ahead and turn there, Esther chapter 4. I um, want to take some time today, before I start my message, uh, to share with you where me and my family are at in our journey of church planning. Those of you who've already heard that me and my wife and my family is going to be leaving uh, most likely in January uh, to head to Cincinnati uh, to plant a church. Uh, if you haven't heard that, you've heard it today, uh, but we get to share that back in April uh, with y'all, and uh, haven't really got an opportunity to catch you up on where God has really brought us. And so because of that, I'm just going to take some brief time to share kind of where our journey began up to where we are today. And I really believe that this message today is birthed out of what God gave us in this time. Uh, one of the texts that God gave us during this time to really encourage us and to challenge us to step out in our faith. And so our journey really began back last year, really God began to put a burden, something on our hearts that he was doing something different. And I don't know about y'all, whenever God does that, it gets real uncomfortable quick. Because a lot of times what God is doing is causing you to want to change where you're at, the comfort, right? The, the place in which you're at, he's beginning to challenge you to step out in faith into another area which you maybe don't fully know all the answers. And so we begin to pray and ask God what that was. And in January, we begin to search and seek what church planning would look like. For us, we had an idea of what that would be, but we had to really ask God, is this something you would call us to? Is this something um, that we should be doing? Is this something you prepared us for? And so we spent time between January and about March praying, looking and seeing where areas of need were, and God opened the door for us to go and visit a couple places. He put on our heart two places, Cincinnati and Indianapolis. We took a trip back in April to go there. And here's the craziest part, guys. When God puts something on your heart that he's doing something bigger, you better take a step of faith. That was really where we were. We had to take a step of faith and to see, is this where God's leading us? We believe that God's big enough if he's going to lead you to a place. He'll open a door, he'll close the door. And so we took this trip, didn't really exactly know what we were doing, showed up. Talked with a couple of people in Cincinnati as well as Indianapolis. And on our flight back, I remember Brittany asking me the, this question. Hey, honey, did either one of these places stick out to you that we need to go and plant a church? And I just told her this. I said, I'm not sure yet, but I know this, that God showed me enough that if we don't go, then we're going to be out of the will of God. That if we don't go, God owed, so burdened us on the areas in which we visited that we needed to go. God had been preparing us for the last, we believe, if you think about it, since salvation for me, almost 10 years, but really here on staff for the last seven years for an opportunity like this to go impact lostness in this city. Let me just share some statistics with you. In Cincinnati, that's where we ended up going, deciding that we're going to go plant a church in Cincinnati. There's over 2 million people in this area which we're trying to reach. It's estimated at about 10,000 people to every one church. Again, we're talking about it from a Christian standpoint. One church. We also begin to look at, they believe that also... In that 2 million people, only about 14% attend a church. So we're looking at somewhere around 1.6, 1.7 million. Now, you all know statistics can all be inflated, so let's just take that number down to a million people don't go to church. You think there's some people that need church there? Some people that need Jesus there? So we felt that same burden. That's only a little bit of what God really birthed in our hearts. So as we shared with y'all back in April, we began to seek where God was going to lead us. Obviously, we told you Cincinnati, but it took a lot to get us there, right? So back in May... We took a trip as a family, drove up there, hung out with some church planners, got to see the work that God was doing there, and we knew this is where God was calling us. He'd been opening up doors and preparing us. Guys, you heard me say right before um, that, you know, whenever you begin to take times like today and just reflect on what God's done, do you know that God's been preparing you for such a place, and that place may be here, that God is constantly preparing us for greater things. It's just whether we realize it or not. And so for us in this journey, it's been amazing how God has grown us. It's been tough. 
but it's also been exciting. And I think, just so you all know this, is some of the greatest things you'll do for God will be some of the hardest things you'll ever do. It's not easy. You have to make a lot of difficult choices. One of the things that we did uh, Friday, I was here, yeah, Friday, I think it was Friday, we put our house on the market. We love this house, love our community. It was one of the most difficult things that we could do. Something that we're going to be doing in September is taking an assessment with the North American Mission Board to see if they'll sponsor us to go. If everything goes right there, then we're heading towards January to plant a church. Now, I've had some people ask this question, hey, do you already have a church, church building that you're going to jump in and start? No, uh-uh. No, we're going to go, and we're praying some people to go with this, and we're going to go there and meet some people, win some people to Jesus. And we're going to start just a small group in our home. And we're going to start there, and we're going to pray hard, and we're going to believe God for big things, and we're going to reach some more people, and we're going to go start a church. I don't know where that's going to be exactly. We have some ideas where God's led us. But I know this, that God has a work for us. And if we don't go, who will? And I'm praying that you'll join us. And so one of the cool things that we get to do is here on September 15th, on a Sunday night at 5 p.m., I'm inviting you now. You'll hear about it more later. September 15th, go ahead and jot it down. On a Sunday night here in our student center at 5 p.m., uh, I want everybody to come. We're going to get an opportunity to share uh, a little bit more details than what I just shared with you now, an opportunity for you to partner with us, pray with us, really get on our newsletter and be a part of the journey. Because I know this, we will not be able to go unless you send us, unless you encourage us through prayer and support. Uh, and I love this. I already know I have church members in this room that have constantly come up to me and said, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm ready to go and do whatever I can to help you, and I'm thankful for that. And so don't forget that. The other is, I've had several ask this question, hey, how can we start now supporting you? And one of the things they ask is, can we financially support you right now? The answer is yes. You can actually begin that today. Um, if you want to give today to our, our church plant, you can actually do that in service. Uh, write Cincinnati Church Plant in your memo. Also, you can give online. You'll see a Cincinnati Church Plant as well on there. But here's my encouragement, guys. This is not a place to stick your tithe. This is not a place to take away from this church here. This is above and beyond that. And so I'm just praying that you go to God and you ask God how you can be a part of what we're doing uh, in Cincinnati. And again, if you want to hear more, which I pray you do, September 15th, uh, 5 p.m., and you'll hear more about this. There's a sign-up sheet out here at the sign-up desk. Sign up your name. I'm going to provide a meal for you. I'm hoping that you'll be so uh, enjoying the food that you'll just love everything I say that day because honestly... I still don't know exactly what we're going to share, but we have a lot to share. So I know that took a little while to share that, but I really wanted to, to get everybody up to date where we're at. So be praying for us. Uh, there's a lot ahead of us, but thankful for a church that supports and encourages and prays and really believes in ascending church uh, to send people out to go impact the kingdom. And so today we're in Esther chapter 4. Before I have us read, I really want to get everybody up to date on where we're at in Esther chapter 4. If you were to read Esther chapter 1, 2, and 3, here's some characters you're going to be dealing with. I just want to kind of keep everybody up to date. Number one, you're going to be dealing with the king, King Uhazarus or Xerxes. It's going to be mentioned in the Bible in Esther chapter 1. This king uh, was over, I think it's 173 providences, over a lot of massive land. Within this land, there was millions of Jews that were a part of that, which was God's people. The Jews were God's people. We, we begin to see in here that he had a banquet uh, where he had a lot of people there, a lot of people that he really uh, obviously was trying to wine and dine. And he asked for his queen Vashti to come in and see him. She refused. Can't believe a woman refused to come in and see the king. I mean, come on. But she refused. But guess what? There was a problem. Because she refused, the king was fearful. He gathered some men around. He says this, guys, if I let this pass... The other women in all of our areas will revolt against their husbands. What should we do? And so they decided to go ahead and take her down and not be a queen anymore and move her away from being a queen. And they said, hey, now you need to go seek out and find a queen. And so there began to be this big process of finding a new queen for the king. And this is where Esther comes in. We're going to hear about Esther. Esther's going to be a key part of the story. So does Mordecai. But Esther was a Jew. She was raised by Mordecai, a family member. And here's what we know in this whole process. And they, they were looking for a queen that was the best of all the land. Hundreds and hundreds of queens came, but something was different about Esther. And this is what we begin to see God's working, right? God had a plan in Esther's life. 
So in it ended up being where Esther becomes the queen, which I know this, I'm summarizing this. Go back and read those first three chapters. Esther becomes the queen. And then we begin to see this character by the name of Haman. I can only guess how he got his name. I'm just going to walk up to him all the time and say, hey, man, what's up? That's how I remember his name. So Haman did not like the Jews. He despised them most of his life. But then he had this guy by the name of Mordecai, who, see, Haman was the second in command pretty much to the king. And when people would, he would pass by people, they were supposed to bow. Well, Mordecai said, I'm not bowing to you. And once uh, Haman realized that Mordecai was a Jew, he despised the Jews even more, so much that he went to the king and he says this, King, if we destroy all the Jews and take all of their plunder, we can put that into your treasuries and you'll be rich. And he said, yeah, go ahead. Here's my signet ring. Go, and you can choose a time in the future to kill all of the Jews. Here's the thing the king didn't know that his own queen, now Queen Esther, was a Jew. And this is really where we pick up in the story. And then we're going to read this in chapter 4. So if you can, Esther chapter 4, go ahead and stand with me. We're going to read God's word, and we do this so we can honor God and what we're reading. So Esther chapter 4, if you found it, say amen. All right, it says, When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes. And again, all that had happened was the decree that all the Jews were going to be massacred on a certain date. So he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, and he went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud, bitter cry, and he went out as far as the front king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many laying sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and the eunuchs came and told her the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hathach went out to the Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay in the king's treasury to destroy all the Jews." He also gave him a copy of the written decree to their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplications to him and to plead before him for her people. So Hathach returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and gave him a command to Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's providences know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called... He has one law, put all to death, except the one whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king's these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And here's how Mordecai responded. He told them to answer Esther this. Do not think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace or any more than any of the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews who are present in Sushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day, my maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go into the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish." So Mordecai went his way and did according to what Esther commanded him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you, Lord. We are so thankful for today, Lord, so thankful for your word that you've given us as an example of faithful people who have lived by your commands. Lord, I pray today that hearts are open and eyes are seen, Lord, your work that you're wanting to do through each one of our lives, Lord, to go. Maybe we've been raised up for such a time as this to save a people for your glory and your good, Lord. And we pray this in your heavenly name. Amen. I know there's a lot of text there, but I really wanted us to see this picture, the whole picture of where we're at in this setting. Esther is the queen. She has full access to the king when he wants, when he calls her. But if she is to go without being called, there's a risk. And so the first thing that we see here is the crisis and the call. Here's the crisis. Jews, all Jews, and there's millions of them, will be massacred, will be killed on a certain day in the future. And if nothing's done, this will be happening. So you see the Jews mourning and fasting and putting on sackcloth, and they're basically desperate for someone to move who has the ability to impact their lives being saved. 
So we see this crisis. But the other thing that we see is this call from Mordecai. On verse uh, 8, it says this, that he might command her. So he's telling Hathach to go tell Esther. This is Mordecai telling him that he might command her to go into the king and make supplications to him and plead before him to the people. And so we see this call that Mordecai puts on Esther to go before the king and save their people. Now remember this, the king does not know that Esther is a Jew. I think that would have changed him agreeing to go ahead and do that and to sign off on, make that a law. Uh, But he didn't know. And we obviously don't fully know that, but God does, and he knew there was a time and special place for it. So she was made aware of this magnitude of the crisis that needed to do something about it. So let's see how she responded. She responded in verses 10 down to 12, explaining all that would happen to her. So guess what? There was the crisis and the call, but then there was the cost. There was the cost. See, to do something great for God as she was getting ready to be asked to do, it was going to cost her something. And we begin to see that she says, this cost my life. But let's look at the picture a little bit further. She's a queen. She's in the palace. She has servants. She has good food, good clothing. Uh, she has a lot of things that are satisfactory to the body, to the, to the flesh, that could really say, I don't want to lose this. I don't want to go risk my life for the sake of others because I have so many things that I want to do or I get to do that I Love, right, from a fleshly standpoint. I don't know about you, but there's times in my life where God has asked me to do something, and that same thing runs through my mind, and I begin to write it out, and I say, Lord, but this, but, but, but I have to give up this, but I might have to risk this, or I might lose family members. I might not be able to see family members. I might have to give up that. Do you know that, that I just want to be very clear here. The call in which God has called each one of us to is this call in which we will have to sacrifice something in order for the sake of others to see and to hear the gospel. We cannot sit in a place like Esther did and close our eyes and plug our ears and say, I didn't know. Because today, if you're sitting in here today, you hear that there's a need. There's a need for people to hear the gospel. We're probably in a room full of people who fully don't have maybe heard the gospel completely, that Christ has come so to set them free so that they may have a relationship with God forever. And so we see the crisis. We see the call. We see the cost that obviously Esther is very, very worried about. But one of the things that I see in this is she says, go, she's talking to Hathach. This is the guy in the middle that has a lot of responsibility. My guess is he didn't have a notepad So we had to memorize these words and imagine going back and forth. But anyways, she said, now go send this to Mordecai to tell him that I'm going to have to risk my life. And I don't know if I want to do that. How many of y'all have had something that you know you should do? And then you call a friend hoping they'll tell you not to go do it. Anybody? I mean, I, I do that. I mean, like there's this, like I should probably help this person out. And I like call up Brittany, you know, should I do this? I mean, I don't really have time today. Tell me I need to come home. I need to come home, right, early, and and many times it's pushed back, and it's like, no, you really should go do this, and then you're kind of like, yeah, you're right, I guess I should do that, right? I I, I may be the only one that's ever been in that spot where God's put me in a place where I've had to sacrifice time, where I've had to sacrifice money, I've had to sacrifice a little bit of everything, right, humility, where I had to go and do something for someone else, so that God could get glory, so I could show the love of Christ then, but I didn't desire. So I was looking for a way out. And I believe this is probably what Esther was doing is, I'm hoping maybe Mordecai will tell me not to go. So here's the other side. How many of y'all been asked to do something? Hey, will you go on a mission trip with me? Because there's people who need to hear the gospel. And your response is, I'll pray about it. Now here, don't discount what I'm saying here. Prayer is a good thing. Prayer is a great thing. But as that is one of the easiest excuses to every call that God gives us, I'll pray about it. Now, here's my hope is that you go pray about it, but there still has to come back to this response. There was something as I began to study about this that I was reminded that our greatest hiding place from obedience is saying, I'll pray about it. Pat Hood, I'd read this book a long time ago, but Pat Hood reminded me of this. When God speaks, you shouldn't have to pray about obeying. Prayer becomes a common hiding place for people in the response to obeying God. I just want to get honest with you. We're getting ready to see this, that the next thing we're going to see in this text is truth. Truth. 
Mordecai is wanting to speak truth into Esther's life. And it's about time that we probably start speaking more truth to one another and saying this, we need to stop hiding behind, I'm always gonna pray about it. You should go pray. But more times than not, you should respond in obedience and being a part of helping others. It's all about what we get to do. It's not about us anymore when we come to faith in Christ, guys. I just wanna be honest. When you study your Bible, it's not about you anymore after you come to Christ. It's about others. It's about God and his work for the rest of our lives on this earth, no matter the sacrifice it takes. I've made this statement so many times and maybe it only speaks to me. The easiest part of obedience is knowing what to do. Many of us are so overwhelmed with knowledge of what God has called us to do, but we do not obey because that's the hardest part. The only way we'll ever obey is when we have people like Mordecai that says, here's the truth. If you don't go do it, God's gonna raise somebody else up. And you sit here and go, yes, just what I wanted, God. You're gonna raise somebody else up. I can stay in my comfort. I can keep my home. I can stay where I'm at. I don't have to sacrifice anything. And this is what God says. It'll cost you. It'll cost you in rewards. It'll cost you in things where you're disobedient to the Lord. And if you're disobedient to the Lord, that is a bad place to be. Now, we're not sitting here talking about losing your salvation, but we are sitting here talking about chastening. How many of y'all know this? When you tell your child to do something and they don't do it, what comes? Chastening. Now, I still may clean the dishes after I told my kids to do them because I'm frustrated at them, but then I'm still gonna go back them, to them and chasing them. Why? So that the next time they will respond in obedience. Please understand this isn't about abuse. This is about a heavenly father who sent his son Jesus to die on the cross so that we may have access to Jesus, access to God for the rest of our lives and for eternity. Is he not worth obeying? Just because of that simple fact, is he not worth sacrificing everything that you have, your life, your money, your job, your home? I'm in the middle of that. It's not easy, but it's worth it. Because there's gonna be one day when I stand before the Lord and I can begin to see that that was worth it. This life is not meant for me anymore. And it's not meant for you. And for Esther, that position that she was in was not meant for her. It was meant for God's purpose. There's no reason why Queen Esther should have been in that position. Outside of God's will and God's sovereignty to put her in that place. And we see that she has a challenge that she can choose to accept or disobey. And let's see the truth that Mordecai gave. Mordecai gave this truth in verse 13, and he told Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than the other Jews. If she goes and puts her fingers in her ears and closes her eyes and says, no, 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 I don't hear anything, that decree still goes through. She's a Jew. Guess what? They're probably gonna go in and kill her too. The king can't stop anything, just so you know. Once it's a decree, he can't stop anything. Now, you'll see later, you'll have to read that text, but you'll see later how God actually saved the people by creating another decree for them to defend themselves. But what we see here is that she wasn't gonna be able to hide from it. She wasn't gonna be able to hide from it. You're gonna go on from there. And if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place. And I talk about that. That's sometimes one of our greatest hiding places is that somebody else will do it. But guys, here's the part that I want us to hang on. And I know we're right in the middle of this message, but I want us to hang on this. He says this, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom in such a time as this? That's the moment where all of us wake up and realize where we are at in our lives. God has sovereignly ordained this moment in time for you to be in this service today to know that God has designed today for you to make a difference. For Esther, it was where she was and her position in the palace, but for you, it could be your job. For you, it could be your position in your home, to in your church, to in your community. You have a position somewhere where God wants to use to save people. So Ben, how do you know that? Because you're still alive. I know this, God is done with you the moment that you pass from this earth. So if you've accepted Christ and you're still breathing today, God wants to use you. I'm gonna read this again. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom at such a time as this. Think about it. Yeah, it's starting to sink in, isn't it? It's not easy sometimes to realize that maybe God's placed you where you are. 
for such a time as this that somebody might hear the gospel, respond because of your obedience, and they'll one day live in eternity forever because of your obedience. I, I focus most of my life more on the now and the present. You want to know why? Because whenever I get to lead somebody to faith in Christ, I get to see this light turn on that they get to experience Christ now. They get to experience the hope now. The burden that they have on their lives of what their life is for is removed, and they begin to see that their life is to live in freedom in Christ and to help others experience that same thing. That's one of the greatest experiences that we can have. So I want us to know this. There's a crisis just like Esther had. Yes, maybe there's not a millions and millions of people that are getting ready to pass away on this specific day that we know of, but I know this, the Lord's promise return says this, that there will be a day when everyone will stand before the Lord, and we have no clue when that time will be for everybody. But when that time comes, if you refuse to share and they stand before the Lord, that'll be held accountable to you. Do you know know that? That he says this, for much that is given, much is expected. You've been given the gospel message truth. If you've received that, And come to faith in Christ when you refuse to share it and do everything you can so that others can hear you're responsible for it. That's sometimes tough for us to hear. We see this as well. That whenever you begin to realize that someone's waiting for you on the other side of obedience, I I know this. That if I don't come home each night, somebody's waiting on me, and it's my family. Somebody's waiting for me. Every time I get home, they're anxiously waiting for me. And just imagine there's people out there waiting for you to respond in obedience, just as Esther is going to choose to do as well. I remember being asked this question several times in the last several months. is, hey, Ben, why church planning for us? Just so you know, we're in the midst of this call of going, right? Why church planning, Ben? Why church planning in Cincinnati? And I always say this, number one, um, because this is where we believe God has really opened the door for us, that we begin to lay everything on the table and say, Lord, there's nothing that can't be yours. No place, no time, no area. We believe this as well as the more I study, I wanna be about my father's business, wherever he would call us, right? But then I begin to ask this question back to those who ask me, why church planning, why Cincinnati? I wanna ask this question, why Tahlequah? Why Fort Gibson? Every single one of us is called somewhere. Every single one of us is called to someone. And as much as I have to answer, which I want to, because I can't wait to continually, excitedly answer why Cincinnati, why church planning, I want to continue to challenge you. Why Tahlequah? Why Fort Gibson? Why wherever you live? Because you need to be able to defend that of why God's called you here. Because that will help us live every day like Esther lived. So remember every day to ask yourself that question. Why here? I believe God has a perfect plan for each one of us, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend just brief time on this. This is something that God's taught me. Why do you believe that, Ben, that God has a perfect plan for you? Because if you go back to Adam and Eve, his goal was to create Adam and Eve and to spend forever with him in the garden. But that didn't happen because of their sin. Did, did you know that Israel, when they were, loot, uh, were saved from Egypt, that their journey to the promised land was supposed to be a couple of weeks, I think, somewhere in there? It took over 40 years plus, To get there, God had a perfect plan for them, but it was their disobedience that caused it to take a little bit longer. Then why do you even mention about a perfect plan? It's because I think it's easy for us to think that, you know, if I just go about life, we'll get there. It's all the same road, right? No, I think God is constantly saying, I want you to be on the right path. I want you to be on a path that I have for you that's perfect. But we have to obey to see that perfect path path and it takes faith Hebrews eleven six. 6 without faith you can't please God and I'm begin to study about faith a little bit more this last couple of weeks faith is obeying God in spite of what we see how we feel and what consequences we might experience faith is obeying God in spite of what we see how we feel and what consequences we might see or experience so because of that perfect plan that God has we should be seeking to find it and obeying every opportunity that God gives us right And so what causes us to not use the opportunities that God has given us to lead people to faith in Christ? Maybe you're asking that your question is, is what's stopping you from fully seizing the opportunity 
that maybe God's raising you up for such a time as this to impact your community, your house, your job, your church. We're unwilling to sacrifice the cost that it takes to obey the Lord. That's what prevents us. We're unwilling to sacrifice. You know, it's interesting as I begin to think about this, of all the resources it takes to send somebody to go plant a church, and I begin to think, God, how in the heck are you going to do this? And then I begin to realize this, God's raised up so many people for such a time as this so that those people in Cincinnati can hear the gospel. And many of those who are in this room and around this state and around the world are excited to be a part of that. What's stopping you? When we think about the rich young ruler, it was his money. When we think about others, it was their time. When we think about many, it's their inexperience. Think about Esther, I'm just a queen. I can't go in before the king unless he calls me. But she realizes this, I have to do something. I have to do something. So let's look at her response. So obviously we see the crisis, the call. We see the cost it's gonna take and Mordecai's truth that he spoke. But we see her response in verses 15 through 17. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. This is where we see Esther going to the right place. She says, if I'm gonna go do this, let's get desperate before the Lord. There's no way that we can obey God the way he desires if we're not desperate. I know this, if I go without food for six hours, I'm pretty desperate. They went without it for three days. I just wanna be honest with you here, okay? So he says, my maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go into the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. She came to the conclusion to say this, Mordecai, you're right. My life is worth the sacrifice to see millions and millions of my people be saved. You may seriously sit here and think your life may not be able to save millions and millions and millions of people. But I, I, I've heard somewhat similar to this statement that your life may save the one who touches millions and millions and millions of people's lives. You never know. You always hear those stories of the Billy Graham story and who led him to faith in Christ, right? There's several of those stories of we don't even know those people's names, but it's because we are... It's not about them, it's about Christ using them. No matter their position or their place, no matter what God has given them and not given them, and the fact of, when you talk about Queen Esther, you could be a janitor, you could be a stay-at-home mom, you can be a CEO, it doesn't matter. God uses every one of us to reach someone for his kingdom, to save people. And so we see, yes, she trusted God, and yes, Mordecai had a huge part in this, But I begin to ask this question, what's holding you back? Maybe it's living in a nice home, maybe it's nice things, friends, security, family. What are you unwilling to sacrifice so that someone can experience the hope you have in Christ? I believe the picture today is this, and just so I can clear up this, and I only have a few more minutes, I wanna clear this up. When Esther obeyed, she went before the king and she says this, hey, can I throw a banquet for you? And and I, I kinda missed out on the part where she came before him and he did hold out the gold scepter and accept her in. And she says this, he says, I'll give you this... I'm sorry, I'm pushing through this real quick, but when the king accepts Esther in with the gold scepter, he says, what do you want? Up to half the kingdom I'll give you. Wow, she was just coming in to ask for her people's lives, and he says, I'll give you half the kingdom. Do you know that she could have went back selfish and said, hey, y'all give me half the kingdom, I'm out, peace. Go read the story, you need to go read the whole story. But no, she says, hey king, can I just throw you and Haman a banquet? And he said, sure, whatever you want. And so she threw a banquet the next night. Haman and the king came. And he says, okay, really, really, what do you want? Up to half the kingdom, what do you want? And she says, hey, can I throw you another banquet tomorrow night? And he said, okay, that's fine, whatever. So they come back that next night, and he says, no, seriously, what do you want? And she says, all I want is for you to save my people. And he says, well, who's going to kill your people? This guy, Haman, on your left. Okay, this story, I'm not going to go on from this, but here's what we know. Esther's obedience, willing to sacrifice her life, saved millions of people. I don't think we get that these stories in the Bible are real and that God wants those to be the stories that we write in history right here today. I I, I look at the the risks, quote unquote, risks that we've taken as a church in the last couple of months with going to Tahlequah to plant a church. Yes, 
It's risky, but it's worth it. It's worth it. If each one of us would be willing to sacrifice what it takes to be obedient, to see others come to faith in Christ. It's really the matter of picture of perspective. Which side do we want to look on it? It's difficult at times, guys, because it is the flesh battling against the spirit in instances like this. So let me just conclude with this. Yes, pretty much titled my message this way, God's ways are higher than ours. You don't know why I titled it that message is because I have to tell myself that every day. That God's ways are higher than ours. Because whenever I don't have that right, this is the statement that ends up coming out in my life. My ways are greater than his. And guess who gets glory whenever I do that? Me. Guess who gets the focus? Me. But whenever I continually say God's ways are higher than mine, God gets glory. God can use me because I'm surrendering to his will. We see Esther use that same thing. It took her a while, right? Because she was a little bit afraid. But she says, you know what? His ways are higher than mine. I'm gonna go before the king. What's God calling you to do? I often wonder if we fully understand the magnitude and power of God. Think about this, that God literally today is holding everything together so that you can be here today. I'm gonna do something that you may think is crazy, but I really want you to take a second here. I want everyone in the room, I want you to take a deep breath on the count of three. One, two, three. Do you know that God created that air so that you can breathe? And the next time that you breathe, and the next time that you breathe, and the next time that you breathe, that God created that air. And that's one of the simple things that God does every day without us asking. Just imagine when you begin to write out everything that God allows you to do and experience. And the life that you are living right now is because of God. And when we begin to see that God gave you that breath, that his ways are higher than yours, and that there should be nothing that you should not sacrifice for the sake of others experiencing the same thing that you're experiencing, which is a relationship with Christ. I know this, that God not only holds our lives right now, he holds our eternity. When you begin to think about this, that God has determined this and you can't change it, we all have one thing in common. We will pass from this earth one day. Unless the Lord comes back, we will pass from this earth one day. We're all gonna die. I'm sorry if that's shocking to some of you, but we're all gonna die. We're gonna spend our lives in eternity in one of two places, in heaven or hell. God does not force us to have a relationship with him, but he gives us the opportunity and he gave up everything so that we could through his son, Jesus Christ. Dying on the cross. Here's what the Bible says. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Here's what I know when it comes to sin. I learned this at camp. It helps me stay Focused every day on what my sin is. Sin is anything that we think, say, do, or don't do that displeases God. And I'm gonna say that again. I'm gonna say it really slow because some of y'all are gonna take this out and remember this every day. Sin is what separates us from God. This is how we cannot have a relationship with God. We had to have a perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ to pay for our sins so that we can have a relationship with him. So God desires for us to not sin. So sin is anything that we think, Anything we say, anything we do and we don't do that displeases God. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for you and for me and those all around us. And he wants you to accept that today. But I wanna leave you with just a couple of challenges. It's number one, if you have not experienced a relationship with Christ, I think today is a day for you to see what that looks like, to experience a relationship to understand that the God of heaven who created you and gave you that breath that you breathed in today wants to know you personally. He not only wants to know you personally, but he wants to give you an eternity in heaven with him one day. And so today, maybe that's a decision you need to make. Maybe for some of us, we need to look at maybe the story of Esther. If you've come to faith in Christ and you're looking at the story of Esther, you're saying this. This is really what I want you to leave home today. Yet who knows whether you have came to the kingdom or to this time for such a place as this. God has placed you where you're at, not necessarily in your seat today, not necessarily in your home, but everything from your work to your influence. And for some of you, I wanna say this, your finances that you're holding off, that you're hoping is gonna last you till retirement, why don't you just give that to the Lord and let him deal with it? Let's look at your time because guess what? We have 
So many things on our calendar. I'm just telling you this. I don't need any more things on my calendar because I've already got a list for the next calendar that I need to make. Maybe it's so today you sacrifice some of those things for God's glory so that you can invest in him and invest in his kingdom. So today I want you to spend some time during our invitation asking God, what is it that I'm unwilling to sacrifice for your glory? What is it, Lord, that you've put me in this place for this specific time? And ask God to use you just as Esther was used. Every day we should be asking that question, Lord, what do you want me to do? It's your ways over my ways.